Good luck, good morning. Uh, today, I'm uh, really pleased to be here with Minister uh, of Crown Indigenous Relations, Mark Miller, who is also the co-chair of the Inuit uh, Crown Partnership Committee meeting, or committee process. Uh, we had a meeting here in Ottawa yesterday, and at that meeting, uh, Inuit leadership and federal cabinet ministers worked on a number of different issues. Uh, we were able to, to um, approve the implementation of um, the Inuit Nunangat housing strategy. We also talked through a number of different issues in related to um, uh, food security, uh, infrastructure, uh, housing, and then also the way in which we work together, either through land claim implementation or through other processes such as the Inuit Nunangat policy. At the meeting, we also endorsed the um, principles of co-development between Inuit and the Crown. This is building upon the, um, uh, the Inuit Nunangat policy that was passed uh, by the Government of Canada and was developed in co-development with Inuit and that was done in April of this year. The co-development principles are uh, meant to inform not only federal legislation, but also any major initiatives or programs or services that are, um, that are considered by the Government of Canada that uh, categorically impact Inuit. This is meant to clarify the space uh, um, when the Government of Canada talks about co-development with Indigenous peoples. For Inuit, now we have a clear roadmap and a clear plan that, um, or a clear set of principles that we will, we will work under from the very beginning so as to ensure co-development in spaces where uh, Inuit and the federal government wish to co-develop co initiatives together. This builds upon um, the foundation of Section 35 and Inuit Section 35 rights. It also builds upon the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and its implementation in Canada. It also works uh, to clarify the space in which uh, um, the federal government works on Indigenous legislation and Indigenous policy. This can only have positive uh, implications for our working relationship and for reconciliation efforts. There are many uses for this, these code development principles moving forward, and we will rely on the federal government uh, and its goodwill in the implementation of these in a categorical way across um, government. The Inuit Crown Partnership Committee continues to be a positive, productive mechanism that Inuit use with the federal government to further our self-determination, to realize um, reconciliation with the government of Canada, and to practically work through the issues that affect Inuit the most. Uh, we're appreciative of Minister Miller and also the other ministers who were part of the process yesterday and continue to be um, champions of uh, Inuit-specific issues within the distinctions-based approach that this federal government has um, has ha, has said that they are a part of and ha, is now showing um, that they are willing to work with us. Nakumik. Bonjour à tous. Simplement pour réitérer ce que le président Obed a dit euh, il y a quelques secondes hier, on a eu notre réunion du partenariat Couronne Inuit euh, avec évidemment les ayants droits régionaux euh, des, euh, des territoires Inuit pour continuer dans euh, le processus de développement de plusieurs initiatives euh, liées au logement, liées au principe de co-développement législatif entre la Couronne, le gouvernement du Canada et, euh, et les Inuits. Euh, C'était une réunion productive, comme, euh, comme le sont toutes les réunions que, que nous avons avec, euh, avec, avec, dans, dans le contexte de ce partenariat en particulier. Évidemment, on a touché sur tous les enjeux qui touchent, euh, qui touchent euh, les populations inuites et, et comment mieux les servir dans le contexte de réunions productives avec plusieurs ministres, le ministre de la Justice, le ministre des Affaires du Nord, le ministre des Services aux Autochtones, le ministre du Transport et autres, pour s'assurer euh, que, de la perspective du gouvernement fédéral, il y a une approche qui est uniforme euh, en ce qui a trait euh, 
à nos relations avec, euh, avec les Inuits en particulier. Um, à souligner, entre autres, évidemment, euh, développement de principes législatifs, de co-développement très important dans le contexte de plusieurs items euh, législatifs dans la Chambre des communes. Par le passé, le gouvernement s'est revendiqué d'avoir co-développé avec les Inuits plusieurs, euh, plusieurs textes législatifs qui touchent, euh, qui touchent leur peuple. Euh, il y a eu des désaccords, évidemment, en ce, que, euh, ce en quoi c'était vraiment, euh, vraiment du co-développement. Alors là, on a, euh, on a une, une piste de solution en ayant un document qui est entériné par le groupe pour s'assurer que dans, dans le contexte du développement de, de, de législation, il y a des, des principes et, et, et des principes forts pour, uh, pour développer notre législation. I'll simply repeat briefly in English um, what, I, what I said, summarizing essentially what President Obed has just said in the context of our Inuit Crown Partnership Committee. Uh, yesterday, we touched on a number of issues touching Inuit and, uh, and, and how to best serve them. Among others, I'd like to highlight the, uh, the development and the endorsement of the legislative policies, uh, the, le the, the legislative principles um, that will, be, will guide our co-development, which is so important, I think, um, learning from our lessons from the past. We've often said that, that legislative documents and laws have been co-developed. We've disagreed on whether that's the case. So actually sitting down at the table and coming up with what those principles are and uh, how we work together when we're at that critical stage of getting, um, getting laws in front of parliamentarians to vote on and to debate, we have an agreement as, uh, as, as to what the roadmap is. So um, I think at this point, uh, President Oben and I are open to any questions you have. These are principles. How do you make sure that the government is accountable to these principles, that they're actually enforced and you don't end up in a situation like with the Languages Act where the ITK was not happy with that piece of legislation? Well, it was more than not being happy. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't endorse it and support it, uh, particularly because of the specificity of, uh, of you know, to, uh, I think the person behind me and the people that he serves hold us to account. Uh, the government itself holds itself to account. We'll look at a number of mechanisms within cabinet to make sure that as we are developing laws, as the civil service that is independent and has to, has, is the face from a day-to-day -day perspective of what the government of Canada does in its relationship with Inuit, when it is developing laws, is, is well aware of those principles. It follows in the line of a number of documents uh, and principles that we have, um, and policies that we've in, endorsed and, and, and ratified over the course of the Inuit Crown Partnership, notably, notably the Inuit Nunagat policy that we, um, that, we, uh, that we adopted earlier this year, which was really, really groundbreaking because it touches and concerns uh, dozens of ministries and, and agencies so that Inuit aren't re-educating us about our relationship with them every time they sit down at the table. It's hugely time consuming, it's disrespectful, and frankly isn't the best foot forward that we need to put when we're, uh, when we're developing key things like legislation. Uh, Nathan probably has, that was my sister, so. Did you want to add anything? Thanks for the question. We're hopeful that both the Inuit Nunagat policy and these co-development principles uh, can be as, uh, have as much teeth as possible within the federal government. And uh, we can only guess sometimes on what mechanisms the federal government might utilize best to ensure that uh, there is a blanket approach and a whole of government approach to the implementation, not only of the Inuit Nunagat policy, but of these co-developed principles as well. Whether that's a cabinet directive or whether that's, um, you know, a joint letter from myself and Minister Miller to the public service. Who, I, I don't say who knows, but there are a number of different ways that we can go about this. And I, it is just as important for cabinet to, to discuss this and consider it uh, as it is for Minister Miller and I to be here today. Uh, we, we have such goodwill amongst a number of different federal departments and also um, parts of the federal public service but it, it is such a, a large institution, and there are still so many places where we just ha either haven't done work or there isn't the real understanding or consideration of, of Inuit rights and Inuit specificity within uh, the context of development of legislations or laws or policies, that we do need to critically think about how best um, to formally implement uh, this co-development principles policy. Minister Miller, the ITK does not support Bill C-29, which you sponsored, 
And Chief Wilton Littlechild, the former TRC commissioner, has also raised concerns about the language of the bill, saying it's not strong enough, there needs to be a way to make sure the government is held accountable to reconciliation. Are there going to be amend amendments? Can we expect amendments in the Senate from your government on this? Well, I think you've seen, uh, first and foremost, the, the cooperative work that the committee's done with all parties suggesting amendments and, uh, for a large part, ratifying uh, most, most of them. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of, we use unprecedented quite heavily, but there's been a lot of cooperation in the committee in, in, in getting this document, legislative text, more robust to hold us more accountable. I think you should focus um, very in, in, in intensely on what Dr. Littlechild has said because I think it, it, it's, it's a little different than the way you assert. Uh, but obviously we need, a, we need an accountability mechanism to make sure that we are answering the calls to action that every year the Prime Minister is standing up and speaking about the state of reconciliation. Uh, ITK uh, doesn't agree with uh, the current iteration of the law uh, and has some, I think President Obed is obviously best placed to speak about this, but has, uh, ha has some foundational um, objections to, to, to the uh, to the committee itself. Uh, that's something that we respect. Obviously, the, the sense that I've gotten is that it could possibly detract from the work and the focus of rights holders, which is so important. These are rights that have been secured only very recently with respect to the federal government and often get disrespected. So we don't want it to be a distraction away from the work we're doing in the, in the context of the Inuit Crown Partnership. Now, the committee, the commission itself, is designed not necessarily to reflect rights holder. Obviously, they have their say at the table, but it's supposed to be a broad swath of, um, of Indigenous participation so that survivors are being heard, um, people from different regions are being heard. Those aren't necessarily um, rights holder in the sense of, of governance and leadership, but Indigenous peoples themselves that have their views and perspectives and approach to holding the government accountable. So the nature of it, uh, the nature of it in and of itself um, is not one that is, that, is, that is entirely focused on a rights holders dynamic. And the fear there is that it detracts from the work that we do with the ICPC in particular and individual uh, rights holders, Inuit rights holders. And so, I actually think it'll enhance that. President Oban doesn't agree with me, and I, and I get that, and it's entirely their right. Um, I, I think the test of this commission in particular will be uh, the first couple of years. So we won't know from day whether, one whether it's an effective mechanism. It will have, uh, it will have the bones necessary to, to do what it needs to do to hold us to account. Uh, whether it works or not, it, it will be a bit of a test of time. Yeah, I think that the that the legislation, um, in in principle, is one that stems from the TRC. There's a call call to action 53. Uh, the idea that we need to think more about reconciliation is one that we share. Uh, um, you know, uh, that, that is a positive thing to do. The challenge that Inuit face often is that we. Uh, are a minority within a minority. We, our rights and our governance is often overlooked in the way in which uh, decisions are made here in Ottawa. We're, we are changing that and we are forcibly uh, trying to change that through the processes that, that, uh, that we have co-developed with this government and the positions that we continue to hold. The scenario of um, a not-for-profit society that we have uh, the ability to appoint one member in, in a board of 12 that may come up with uh, recommendations directly to a minister that may be um, completely out of sync with Inuit positions uh, and Inuit uh, rights holding um, uh, um, considerations is of great concern to us based on the way in which the federal government and Canadians have chosen to be completely ignorant of our governance and of the difference between rights holding positions and um, not for profit societies. Uh, we see that in the way in which uh, certain institutions and organizations are treated, <laughs> and we also see it in the provisions of the legislation, where um, I don't believe many Canadians understand the difference between uh, 
the representatives of Indigenous peoples versus organizations that serve Indigenous peoples um, on particular issues. So it is still, we are still quite concerned um, from a fundamental level about being understood and our rights being upheld and our institutions being supported in the face of willful ignorance about um, the respect that is necessary for our institutions. You're, you're both here talking about co-development uh, between uh, government and Inuit organizations, and, but, you're, but you're also not on the same page of this legislation. Uh, I'm just curious if you could talk about what's happened on that in the past few days and what's the path forward on it. Yeah. Well, from our perspective, uh, the Government of Canada has been working towards this legislation for years, but the processes that the Government of Canada has used to come to the space where they had the first iteration of the bill uh, were not co-developed with Inuit, and therefore um, our Inuit leadership uh, just like many other pieces of legislation, had to review it, had to come, had to have time to understand it, and then ultimately over the last uh, few weeks has come up with a, a clear position on the legislation. If this d piece of legislation was co-developed uh, from 2017, uh, 2018, when the first considerations of this bill were discussed, I don't believe that we'd be in this uh, scenario where we would have to talk about it. I think what moving forward, what we need to do is work with the government and work with all the interested parties in this legislation, at the Senate as well, to try to constructively try to address the concerns that Inuit have. And hopefully there is a way that, um, that we can support the bill moving forward. Uh, this is, I think, a, a good moment in time to also show that despite the challenges that we may have in positions from time to time, that it in no way is um, ending our relationship and slowing down the work that we do together. Uh, but like any partnership where you have two independent parties, uh, there are many times where there are disagreements in positions and we will constructively try to work through them. Yeah, I would sort of continue along, along those same lines. We've put the national indigenous organizations in the context of this legislation in a bit of a difficult position for what they usually do because they're part of a process that deals uh, intimately with their own people um, in a situation that they don't necessarily control. And, and while their participation on the, uh, on the board is secured, they each get, uh, each of the three national indigenous organizations will appoint someone and there is uh, at this point another in a person, in this case, on the board. This is a process that um, still has a lot of uncertainties related to it. And so, as I mentioned to Olivia, this will have to, the test of it will be time and to see how it holds Canada to account, how it does a proper accounting of the, um, the relationship we have with that organization in terms of production of documents, feedback, um, work throughout the year coming up to the statement by the Prime Minister about the state of reconciliation and actually how people feel it on, on the ground. And so uh, I think if uh, the Inuit's right holders have taught us anything, is it's important to be around the table uh, in the context of, of the ICPC. Uh, I think this is, this is a process that has the potential to even enhance that process, but uh, we will keep focused on not detracting from that process and, and interacting with, with, with Inuit's rights holders that have secured those rights, as I mentioned earlier, only very recently in our history. Uh, and that's in the face of those rights being inherent in the first place. So I'm, I'm optimistic about it. Uh, we'll see what goes through the Senate. Um, we're, open to, we're open to amendments coming from the Senate. Obviously, there's a lot of Indigenous voices in the Senate, and it's, it's, it's supposed to be a, a, um, a broad process where input is welcome. And if you see and if you take any lesson from the work that we've had with the, uh, the multipartisan committee in the House, uh, we will certainly be very open to any reasonable amendments that are advanced by the Senate. And, and I'm curious for like these these co-development principles. Uh, I'm curious how they're different from some of the policies that are already in place, like the Inuit Nunangat framework, and just sort of what results can people expect from them? Yeah, I think you know there's philosophically, philosophically a difference between policy, principle, and action. Uh, these principles will be subject to interpretation. They will set the guidelines uh, very much so for how we. 
how we develop legislation, particularly those, and Crown Indigenous Relations is no exception, but particularly departments that aren't necessarily seized with Indigenous issues on a daily basis, or isn't their main focus, when they put forward legislation, making sure that that, that legislation is, is, is properly co-developed when there are matters that, that, that do touch and concern Inuit in this case. And so it, it, could, be, it could be an example for other rights holders. They are, will obviously be in the, in, 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 the, in the present circumstances matters where we will be engaging with, uh, with ITK and the appropriate rights holders when, when dealing with legislation that, that, touch, uh, that touch Inuit. Where is the actual progress Wellington? And Sorry, solving no the governance issues with the Algonquin? Yeah, not, not, not something, Olivia, that we can speak to publicly. There are discussions that are ongoing, um, and, and, and they're ones where I believe they're productive. I think there is still some, some, some thinking going on among in the Algonquin Nation uh, with respect to the space that's been that, that, uh, the bank behind 100 Wellington, which will be you know, a huge opportunity for the Algonquin Nation to, uh, to really showcase their people in, in, in their, on their unceded territory. So uh, those are discussions that we can't really speak to publicly out of respect in particular for the Algonquin Nation. Um, I think importantly, people are talking, including the National Indigenous Organization heads uh, with, with the Algonquin Nation, which is good because often, often I think a lot of these issues are the result of, um, of miscommunication. So. I'm optimistic, but there's nothing I can share with you at this time. And MMIWG advocates are pointing to the news of the serial, the alleged serial killer in Winnipeg and saying that this shows that the system is not protecting Indigenous women. How is your government going to address this? Um, first, it's, you know, my heart goes out to the, the families of, 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 of the victims. Again, I, I think it's a shock and another wave of fear in what is the epicenter of, um, of an ongoing tragedy with respect to Indigenous women. Um, that fear is real and, you know, often the first very visceral reaction you have from advocates um, is the fear of, of, of a serial killer. Uh, um, it's very much about, and I get there's, there's an ongoing investigation, so I, I do have to limit the words that I use. Um, but this is something that's happened before. Uh, and the federal government clearly has a responsibility. We know that from the final report into missing, murdered, indigenous women and girls. Uh, the results, despite the investments that we've put in, and they're significant, are trailing in the face of a tragedy. I think it's very difficult to talk about success. Uh, because what we see is, is this pattern repeating itself. I hesitate to say this, but this is much more than one, one person. And, and, and if there's any lesson from, from um, the final report is that we have to continue addressing this in a systemic way, whether it's reform of child and family services, whether it's um, the work we need to do to keep women, Indigenous women and children, physically safe, building more shelters, getting those out quicker than they're going out now, um, making sure there are 24-hour safe spaces like we recently announced with respect to, to Velma's House, which has been chronically underfunded both by the federal government, particularly by the provincial and, and uh, provincial government. Um, but there, this is a pattern that isn't, again, limited to one person, one city, or, or, or one country. Uh, it, it, it's the legacy of... of um, a devastating history that has reverberations today uh, and no one can stand in front of you with confidence to say that this won't happen again and that's um, I think that's kind of shameful. I don't know if President Obed, you want to say Just on this particular issue, uh, you know, my heart goes out to uh, the victims and their families and all uh, uh, people who are affected by this news. Um, this, at the heart of this are communities and members of communities. And until we forcibly interrupt um, the way in which there is systemic devaluation of Indigenous women and girls in communities and systems that are meant to support and care for those people, 
uh, we are unfortunately going to continue to see the results of, of systems not taking care of all members of society. Uh, and it, and it, whether it is police systems or whether it's governments or whether it is um, indigenous leaders and organizations, we all have to do better and we all have to find ways to interrupt the very clear reasons why this is happening that were set out in the calls for justice and also in many other inquiries in many other formal um, reviews of why this uh, issue has been so widespread for so long. None of the work we do is going to ease the pain of those who are suffering because of this, these tragedies. But we can stop others from happening and we can change the lives and change the course of Canada uh, through the work that we do together on implementing the calls for justice. And so it is in moments like this where I hope that we are all just forced, I think, into more urgency on this issue and also to not accept that what we have done to date is enough.